Hello, welcome to Politics South East. In the next half hour, as the plan to send refugees and migrants to Rwanda struggles to get off the ground, what should the government do next? We will not be put off by the inevitable legal last-minute challenges, nor we will allow mobs, Madam Deputy Speaker, to block removals. Monkeypox numbers are rising in England. We'll ask the UK Health Security Agency about cases in the southeast. Even come on, boy. And we meet the people befriending Sussex seagulls. This one is called Stephen. Just comes down and eats out of my hand. Comes and sits with me if I'm sitting out in the garden. Just sits next to me. It's like he just wants to be around me. It's quite sweet. I'm Julia George and with me for the whole programme are Tim Lawton, the Conservative MP for East Worthing and Shoreham, and Thanet's Karen Constantine, who is the Deputy Leader of the Labour Group on Kent County Council. Lovely to have you both with us this week. Good to be here. Let's start with the flight that was supposed to take migrants to Rwanda this week. The idea is to deter people from crossing the channel in small boats and claiming asylum here. But Tuesday's flight, of course, never took off after the European Court of Human Rights intervened. The scheme is also facing challenges in the UK courts. Now, we heard Pretty Patel in the introduction there, Tim, saying she is going to keep going with this policy. Is that a good thing? It's the only practical solution in town at the moment, whatever we might uh, think about it. This evil trade, which brought over 28,000 people across in really dangerous dingers last year, I think the figures are over 11,000 so far this year. I was down in Dover and saw migrants being brought in last week, is the worst possible way to get into the, to the UK. We have got to break the criminal uh, gangs. The French are refusing to intercept those boats at sea. So what is intended with this policy is it will be a complete lottery if you turn up in a boat as to whether you end up in a hotel in Kent or on a plane to Not Rwanda. a complete lottery, surely. It's, it's been confirmed that certain groups would never be sent to Rwanda, um, including unaccompanied children, uh, EU nationals as well. There's a lot we don't know about it, though, isn't there? The Home Office has not modelled its potential impact on the number of asylum claims in the UK, the very thing it's designed to do. Uh, it hasn't published estimates of the number of people it's expecting to relocate, and it hasn't published details of costings for the policy. That said, what do you like about it? Well, some of those details it has published. So it's costing £120 million uh, initially, the agreement with the Rwandan government. It's costing us £5 million a day to house migrants in hotels in this, uh, uh, in this country. It will not uh, involve genuine, unaccompanied, uh, genuine children, um, but it will involve certain adults. The less that the Home Office says about who might be targeted uh, in this, the better. So it will be a lottery, uh, and you will risk paying three, £4,000 to a criminal gang people smuggler for a journey, a dangerous journey, that may end up in you going to Rwanda. And that needs, that message needs to get out loud and clear. We need the planes to start taking off. We need that message to get round, and we need people to think twice before they take that route. What do you think, Karen? Made me feel very ashamed of my country, actually, and very deeply sad. Because I don't think it's a proportionate response. I don't think it's a... Uh, uh, a, de a decent, uh, the response of decent people. I don't ultimately think it will work. I think it's a bit of political showboating as well, which makes me feel very concerned about what's going on. Is, is and, it the fact and, that and well, when you think about the fact that we want to deter these criminals, which is absolutely what we all want, mm. when you think that the, uh, the the crime agency is being cut potentially by up to 20%. When you think about the fact that the Home Office has decreased its asylum, asylum applications because of capacity issues from 28,000 a year to 14,000 a year, you can see why we've got a problem. And, you know, we need to solve that problem by being in negotiations with the French, by using our we judicial have. services. Well, they've failed, and they've failed because right. neither Boris Johnson nor Priti Patel can be taken seriously or negotiate effectively on our behalf. And this is barbaric. Okay. In Israel... Israel tried this and Israel a completely rejected different it. Scheme. So we've given the French £57 million 
to try and break these criminal gangs and to stop people coming uh, across. And yet the numbers trebled uh, last year, and this year they're going to be in excess unless we do something about it. Karen, so, let, let what my... would stop this overnight let me is just the ask... French to intercept the boats and bring people back to the French shore where they started. Let, let's just that look at the, the, your response to the policy, the Rwanda policy, yes. Karen. You have described it as dog whistle politics. Yes. Are you saying it's racist? Yes, I think it is racist. I think if you contrast this with what's happening with the um, people coming from Ukraine, who are quite rightly seeking asylum, we've basically set up a system where they can apply in advance of coming to the UK online, which seems ever so sensible to me, and, you know, of good use of time. And we could do exactly the same for other people. There's no reason why other people of different skin colours shouldn't be able to make those this applications. Is, is... And can I just say one final thing on this point? We have a huge skill shortage here. Some of the people coming to the country, we could, if we process them more quickly, we could get them into the labour market where they would, I, I think they would do great stuff for oh, us. We could, we could I, talk I about that in a moment. I, I, I don't disagree with that. And I Is want it to, ra I, racist policy? Absolutely then? not. I want to see more safe uh, and legal uh, routes. I want to see more schemes, particularly for unaccompanied uh, children. I've supported amendments uh, to do that. But people coming across in these, uh, in these boats are effectively jumping the queue. So when I was in Dover last week, a dinghy with 38 Albanian young men in came. Um, they're not from Africa. They're not from coming from a war zone. Uh, there's not human rights violations widespread across you Albania. Albanian, they so are, you knew they were they, Albanian. They, they, were knew Albanian. they were Albanian. They were interviewed and were all Albanian. Alba, all Alba, all Albanian. Albanian. Yeah. They are a candidate country yes. to go into the EU. Why should we be taking those people? They will be here for months and months being, uh, being processed. They are queue jumping, those genuine asylum seekers that we are taking from war zones like Ukraine, from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Iran, just because yep. they got money to pay people smugglers to do it. And that is well, not because fair. People who have no realistic claim to have a right of, uh, of stay in the United Kingdom. Yeah, and that's what, are, this policy, are, that's what this policy is aimed at dealing with those people, we not are sending genuine them. asylum We are seekers. sending them to a country that has its own issues with human rights. So, that's so where in the 2000, comes. 2018... That's where the racism comes. Please don't point your finger at it, Tim. Let me continue what I was saying. If we were transferring them to Monaco or Canada, I doubt well, we'd have well, this no, sort of no, case I because, think that's it, because it's May Rwanda I, and it's a bad Let me finish this off I, because I do, we... On this issue, I just want to make this point to Tim. The Independent Chief Inspector for Borders and Immigration has yet to rule on whether Rwanda is a suitable country. Uh, well, that's because he's not yet been able to visit uh, Rwanda. But we want not to send people there before mandate. that ruling? No, he's not been given a we mandate accept. to inspect. We had him in front of our Home Affairs Select we Committee we actually... last week. Now, there are certain checks and balances that we've been asking a lot of questions about. There are two monitoring committees mm. being made up of officials, ministers from the UK and Rwanda, to make sure there aren't abuses of human rights, to make sure the accommodation is happening, to make sure we are like getting the service, to make sure we are getting the service that taxpayers in the UK right, are actually paying for. So all those things actually need to be happened. Tim, but, but the racism, the really distasteful racism, is saying because it's an African country, it happens to be Rwanda, that's, that's, is that that's terrible. Is that what you're saying, Karen? If it were Canada because, or Monaco Hold on, or Tim, let Karen no, respond. No, no, because in 2018, 12 refugees were shot in Rwanda for questioning their rights to food because this country still takes LGBT people from Uwanda as valid asylum seekers. So we are sending people and also the judiciary, the human the, the, the human rights courts, are saying they are not sure about the certainty of the judicial process, not just that, that's in not its what operation. Really, that, that's Please not what the let me finish said, what I'm saying. Not, really not just in its operation, but also in the capacity. And these questions have been put to Priti Patel and we're not getting the detail back. Hundred and eighty thousand so people have been settled there safely, so, some by the United Nations themselves. What is wrong with Rwanda and what's your alternative? because not a single practical alternative has come out of the Labour Party. You are Better happy working. for criminal gangs to bring people in increasing numbers Better across the channel. Better working with France. That we, what, what we does are that mean? Mainly what taking, does that mean? Well, what does the mean? Conservatives gave £57 million. Pounds. The government gave We've £57 now, million. Pounds. We have now got to a stage where we are spending yet more money on a scheme that isn't proven on a scheme that we don't have the detail for, on a scheme that actually does disrupt and upset a lot of people like myself because we don't think it's right, and we've got no promise that it's going to work. And frankly, Pretty Patel, Patel, hold on one minute, Pretty Patel <laughs> knew 
that under European law, under the convention that we signed in 1952, that this process wouldn't go ahead. She would have been warned. This process, her briefs would this have process was her. passed by the it's top no three courts in the United Kingdom. And it's subject the Strasbourg to the court ruling court. came Tim, out of nowhere. We're going to leave that one there, but Still thank no you. alternative from the Labour Party. Both very much. Better security negotiations between France and England. Meaningless. Okay. Run by Meaningless. People we are going to move Boris on. Johnson, Thank you. England Meaningless. recorded 202 new cases of monkeypox this week, bringing the total up to 550 since May. Now, it is a virus related to smallpox and often causes a rash that can be extremely painful or itchy. At the moment, it's mainly spreading between gay and bisexual men. Here to tell us more is Trish Manners. Trish is the Deputy Director of the UK Health Security Agency South East. Trish, great to have you with us. Just tell us a little bit more about monkeypox. How is it transmitted? Thanks for having me on the programme. Um, so monkeypox is usually a very rare virus in the UK, um, but we are seeing an increase at the moment and we've certainly got quite a large outbreak. Um, normally it's only associated with travel, but we are seeing some transmission in the UK. Monkeypox is actually pretty hard to catch. It doesn't transmit very easily between people. So you require quite close skin to skin contact to transmit it. Tell me a little bit about the southeast. Is there a sense that it is spreading here yet? I know a lot of the cases that we know about are in London so far, aren't they? Yeah, the vast majority of the cases are still in London. We're still only seeing a very small handful of cases in in the southeast each week. So the the risk remains in London or associated with travel to other European countries, which are also seeing outbreaks at the moment. So in the southeast, we're still seeing very small numbers, but we still need to ensure that we get our message out of, um, about looking out for signs and symptoms and seeking appropriate care if people mm. are concerned. Can you have it without knowing? Um, it's very rare to have it without knowing. It's very rare to have asymptomatic infection like we saw with COVID. Usually you see a, a rash. Some people have very mild rashes, but there is quite a distinctive blistering rash that you see with monkeypox. And that tends to be a sign that clinicians will be able to pick mm. so that they will um, have a higher suspicion that it might be monkeypox mm. and may choose to test. It appears to be spreading at present overwhelmingly among gay and bisexual men. Is it a sexually transmitted disease then? No, so it, it, it's not strictly a sexually transmitted disease, but obviously during sex you have close skin to skin contact. So what we're seeing is if someone with a rash has close contact with someone, for instance, during sex, then they will transmit it. Um, sadly, we are seeing most of our cases in gay, bisexual men, um, and hence we are particularly keen to highlight the risk amongst those um, individuals, particularly if they've recently changed sexual partners, to be aware of unusual rashes and to seek help and seek advice if they're concerned. What is the advice for anyone who thinks they have monkeypox? What should they do and who should they contact? So um, if you are concerned that you have monkeypox, the, your best bet is to contact your local health provider, so either through 111 or your sexual health clinic, um, and to phone ahead beforehand so that you are appropriately isolated. But those places can give you mm. appropriate advice and give you reassurance or, um, or bring you in for testing if they think that you may have monkeypox. Is there any concern that people might not come forward because there is seemingly a link here with casual sex? So um, it, our sexual health clinics are very, very good at engaging with people who have sexually transmitted infections. They're very good at ensuring that any interaction with the service is confidential mm. and treating any conversations very sensitively. And we look to our sexual health services to provide us with guidance about appropriately um, dealing with people who think they've got a sexually mm. transmitted infection. So um, so we we are concerned that if, um, if there is stigma associated with monkeypox that some people won't come forward, but we need to remember that we've got very, very experienced sexual health services who are very used to dealing with these kinds of conversations, asking the right questions mm. and ensuring that they develop the confidence of the individuals, that they will yeah. treat their information okay. with confidence. Um, Brighton and Hove, let's think about that for a moment. Lots of visitors from London. Pride is coming up at the beginning of August. Could that be a flashpoint for, for transmission of, of monkeypox? 
Look, it's difficult to predict. I think what we're seeing is ongoing transmission. Our case numbers are rising week to week, as you will have seen. And um, and certainly we are seeing ongoing transmission. We're also seeing cases in people who've travelled to other European countries. But yes, absolutely, there's potential that some of these events may well promote transmission. But we're working really closely with colleagues in these parts of the country, but also with colleagues such as the Terence Higgins Trust to promote good, safe messaging around these sorts mm. of events to ensure that it's targeted. What is the messaging? I mean, for, for, for gay and bisexual men in Brighton and Hove, what, what is the, the direct advice? So the direct advice is if you have changed sexual partners recently and you have a rash, that you seek help from your local sexual health services. That's, that's really the key. OK. And just a final thought about isolation. How long should somebody, if they have got monkeypox, what, what, what is the recommendation here and how easy will it be for people to follow it, do you think? It's, re it's really tricky and I think we've had a lot of experience with isolation through COVID and so it be, it's become a bit more common and I guess a bit better understood. We recommend people isolate at home and stay out of contact with other people if they can whilst infect infected with monkeypox until the sores clear up. So that's really important that they do that to prevent onward transmission mm -hmm. and in particular to limit the number of sexual partners. Uh, Trish, thank you. Let's um, put some of the points. I know you were struggling to hear uh, Trish on, on the floor here. Trish Mann is the Deputy Director of the UK Health Security Agency. But on that question of um, protecting people financially, perhaps, who have to stay home when they are poorly, we've seen this with COVID, haven't we? Um, we're talking about maybe two to even three weeks with monkeypox. Tim, do you think that we need to think about some sort of financial protection, reparation for those people if they can't go out to we, work? We may have to. I think it's important at this stage not to panic. It's also important to say that anybody can get this, although there does seem, for reasons we do not know, a higher incidence amongst the gay uh, community. It seemed to be affecting younger people more so when COVID was, um, it was older people. So we, we shouldn't panic. Also, I think what COVID has treated us, told us all to do is to just be a bit more careful uh, and that you know diseases can spread like this. If this becomes a more serious thing, then we may have to look at measures whereby people can afford to isolate. With this, I gather you have the outward signs of a, of a rash, whereas with COVID you wouldn't necessarily have those outward mm. signs, although potentially you can still contract it before rashes yeah. um, appear. We don't know enough mm. about, to, about this, but of course the experience of COVID will be I hope that we're above ahead of the curve a bit more than we were necessarily on COVID internationally, not yeah. just here. Uh, Karen, any thoughts on that idea of isolating and, and whether people need support for that to, yes, to work? Yes, yes. I think if people have to isolate and they're going to be forced to uh, perhaps rely on statutory sick pay, which we know is very low, something like £97 a week, and a lot of people can't afford to take that hit in earnings, and we learnt this throughout COVID, uh, then yes, the government would need to step up pretty quickly. I mean, as it stands at the moment, we can see how the, the, this is transmitted, but it's it's also transmitted via coughing, sneezing, clothes, bedding, etc. So it will potentially mm. be in most of the community. I don't mean everybody's going to get infected, obviously, but it could be yeah. in the rest of the community quite easily. And what we then need is to make sure that we've got testing so that people can get access to testing very quickly and proper genomic sequ sequencing so we can see exactly what we're dealing with and exactly the spread. And we were slow at the beginning of COVID to, to do that for obvious reasons because we were learning. And like Tim, I hope that now we've got yeah. those lessons in place and we could put those into practice pretty quickly. Great. Thank you both very much. Now, as we have two seaside politicians on the show this week, we thought we'd tackle one of the burning coastal issues. Do you love seagulls? Would you feed one? Would you even let one eat out of your hand? Marcella Whittingdale's been meeting people in Brighton and Hove who do just that. Stephen Seagull, Stavros, Sid, Sadie and prawn crackers, just a few of the many feathered friends who've become regular visitors to many homes in Brighton and Hove. Hey, Stavros, you should be a star. Yes? Stavros even has his own YouTube channel with tens of thousands of hits. Stavros is my absolute favourite because he not only does et on my kitchen window, but he also then hung around. And as you saw just now, he stands there and listens to what I say a bit, you know. He loves fish fingers, just raw fish fingers, just defrosted, and mealworms. Steven! Come on, boy! 
Steven Seagal knows Sonia Hilton so well, she's got him eating out of her hand. Now he does it all the time, just comes down and eats out of my hand, comes and sits with me if I'm sitting out in the garden, just sits next to me. It's like he just wants to be around me. It's quite sweet. Leave them as they are, you know. I think we can cohabit with each other, you know. It's just, just learning to be with them, I guess, really. But for some, seagulls are a nuisance. There are reports of excessive noise and even physical attacks. All birds are protected by law, including urban seagulls. But councils and pest control companies can apply for a licence to control them. Those powers include the option to destroy nests and eggs and even kill birds which are deemed aggressive, though Natural England stressed those methods should be a last resort and only where there's a risk to public health and safety. And the government say they're now looking into what more they can do to help communities suffering the effects of large numbers of gulls. Behind the chimneys, you see where the... The, the chimney yeah, comes down. And those on call to deal with those effects say they can be damaging and dramatic. In a, an average season, it can be 100, 200 people ringing us. Um, and they, they are incredibly upset. They do shriek very loudly and it can disturb your sleep, especially if you're working nights. Um, obviously, you know, they're shrieking away from four o'clock in the morning. I mean, they will dive bomb you, which obviously is scary. We've had a customer ring us on Monday, where his elderly nan, uh, she's 89, bless her, um, and she's been dive bombed every time she goes out the front door. Um, we've had other people that have been, uh, we had one lady who was pregnant, she couldn't leave the front door because the seagulls every time will dive bomb her. It is a big problem sometimes. A quintessential part of seaside life, Gull colonies are now spreading further inland and expanding. But where the government say they're working on ways to make it easier to deal with gulls, these bird lovers say you can't blame them for snapping up what's on offer. Marcella, with our report there, I was watching your body language, watching the film, Karen, and I'm going to say I think you're more sympathetic to the people being dive-bombed than you are to the seagulls. I think it's terrible that people are dive-bombed. I think it can be really frightening. I've sat on the beach and had gulls swoop down and take a sandwich. We call them the chip thieves in, mm. um, in, in Ramsgate. I think the key point here is to remember that this dive-bombing this is, is brought on by feeding the gulls, and we should stop feeding them. They're wild creatures. Let them scavenge for food and then yeah. And they will recede from, you know, scavenging food directly off, off, off humans so you, as they're eating okay. it. So perhaps, Tim, if human beings behave differently, there wouldn't be the need yes. for the guy who goes in and has to dispatch them it, it doesn't. It doesn't help, I have to say. I was out on the boat visiting a wind farm this morning. We had majestic seagulls flying uh, past the boat. Absolutely fine. If you live by the, the sea, don't be surprised when you hear the noise of, of, of seagulls. But some of them have got really aggressive. You know, if I was sitting on Worthing Beach eating my chips, if I turn my back, they'll be, uh, they'll be gone. And they can be you know, really antagonistic to, uh, to some people. And people who encourage them to eat out of their, their hand, I'm afraid, are only there making the problem worse. It was quite endearing, and neither of you saw it like that at all, no. did you? No, do that with your blue tits, but not with the seagulls. OK, we've say. dispatched the seagulls. <laughs> Finally this no, week. No, we haven't dispatched the seagulls. <laughs> for the we'll programme. For the programme, for the purposes of the programme. We're going to talk finally about a story that I know Tim is passionate about. Lansing Community Hub set to reopen. There's the headline there from one of the local papers. Uh, this refers to Chesham House. It's a community centre in Lansing. The charity run building was due to be sold off actually after running into financial troubles during Covid. But it has had a reprieve and looks set to open its doors again in August. Tell me a little bit about it, Tim. Why does it matter? Well, it's a really important um, community hub in uh, Lansing, particularly looking after older um, people and loneliness. It was lo loneliness week last uh, last week. It was an absolute um, lifeline. They've got a community cafe there. People, lots of volunteers come along and bake cakes. People come and have a, a chat. And it's a, a real lifeline for many people. It's all part of social prescribing as, uh, as well. It's owned by Royal Voluntary Service. In common with many charities, they mm. took a real hit during the uh, pandemic. They run a lot of hospital shops where they got a lot of their revenue uh, from, similar to St John's Ambulance. We also saved a St John's Ambulance headquarters who cater for events and provide uh, 
uh, first aiders for them. There were no events during uh, COVID. So basically, they said, we can't afford to keep it open uh, anymore. Do they own the property? We're actually, they're going to sell it? So they actually own the property, yeah. and they decided that it was making um, a loss. They actually had some flats on top of the property which were unoccupied, and it would cost too much to do them up. The community rallied uh, round. All the volunteers turned, uh, turned up and said, we need to do something about this. I got involved with some of the local uh, councillors. Lots of people have been ringing me saying, I want to make some um, cakes. Other people say, I want to run a, uh, a, a whisk drive. Some other people want to run yoga classes um, there. I had a public um, meeting with full to the gunnels at, this, uh, at mm. this place. We've got some offers to refurbish all the flats at virtually no cost uh, at all. And thanks to one of our fantastic councillors, uh, Steve Niklaus. And last week they said, OK, we can, we can keep it open because there's clearly the demand. Everybody wants mm. it. We, we can bring some finances yeah. in. And this is, this is why they are so important, these community uh, hubs. And we think, actually, it can run at a surplus as well. We can expand the activities. So good result mm. all, uh, all round. Yeah, part of the story is, of course, the challenges that charities have been through in the last couple of years. How sure. are things in, in Thanet for, for charities there, Karen? Really difficult. I mean, we've got the same response from the community. We, the people are very positive. They rally round. Everybody wants to do their bit. We are experiencing burnout from volunteers because there's a, there's a lot to do and there, many mm. people are having to work very hard in the current labour market. Um, but also we're finding that we've got good charities and they can't find bases, you know, because the cost of real estate is well, so expensive. Yeah. We've got Kent Film Foundation, which has got fantastic ideas, mm. wants to work with young people, wants to bring the community together, yeah. wants to do all of those great mm. things, you know, mm. reach out into the community. We can't find them a base. Well, what the bases about the that we've got are being sold, sold off. Ra Ramsgate has successfully bid for levelling up yeah. funding. It's 20 million yeah. that Ramsgate has secured. Projects around the port and the harbour. And there are some benefits, I'm told, for charities that are associated with getting people back into work. That's, that's good for the town, ring, isn't it, it? It's very good for the town, but it's very ring-faced. It's a bit like whack-a-mole. You know, things pop up in one area that need attention, they're not eligible. Things pop up in another area of the town that need attention, and they are eligible. And, and sometimes the funding doesn't follow the need. So sometimes we've got great community groups. Well, I've got some great. We've got some great. I'm not saying that it's not. I'm not saying that it's not. I can put it to really good use in my I am not saying that it's not good, the levelling up money that's coming in. Good. I'm just saying there is a lot of need, and we've got some really brilliant community groups like Kent Found. Film Foundation that can't get a base because real estate is so expensive and because of continual government cuts, Thanet District Council are off offloading properties that could otherwise be used okay. because they have to they have let's, to find that revenue. Let's put that to tip. And we're in a cleft stick. And yeah. the 20, 20 odd million, it's giving what's being taken. Okay. I think councils would love to act as a backstop wherever they can with charities. But as Karen says, and we all know that their finance have been cut back. Sure. I mean, some will hit worse than others. And remember, the government gave a very substantial amount of money to charities because they weren't covered by some of the employment schemes, the furlough and things like that mm. as, uh, as well. So many of our charities were saved by those specific um, grants. It didn't save um, everybody. And those, there were some disproportionately hit because, as I say, St John's Ambulance, they make their money from going to events. There were no events during that, uh, that period. Community uh, cafes, hospital shops just were not happening. Uh, so. We're having to rebuild. This is a really good news uh, example of yeah. how the community but showed course, there was a need for there it There is well. the cost of living crisis, there's inflation. Sure, it's which, not going to get any easier for Which these is why charities. these places will be needed even, uh, even more in the, in the future. So it's right that the RVS have, have seen there is a demand, there is people who are prepared to help raise money um, for it, lay on activities uh, there. But the knock-on effect will be happier local people, fewer lonely local people, causing fewer uh, health mm. uh, problems, and community cohesion. And they, those are quickly, things you have really to value. Quickly. I have to say, since 2010, when I was running the National Equality Partnership and delivering uh, services right across the UK in the voluntary sector, the voluntary sector has pretty much been decimated. It's not a fraction of what it was. And we are now redoing what we, what we had Karen, to do in the past. It's a brilliant question, and one that I'm afraid, maybe we've let him off the hook, Tim hasn't got time to answer. I'd love to answer that <laughs> Right, well, we'll talk charities again on the programme in the future. Really glad we raised it. Lovely to hear about what's happened at Chesham House. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to our guests. I'll be back next Sunday. See you then.